to today is respiratory system and there's only 70 slides it's really not a ton of content uh, there are a couple as always a couple of little tiny challenging details uh, but we will have as always plenty of time to work our way through them so there's a lot of anatomy for this one this is a pretty big topic for the lab practical uh, we'll, we'll talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system the division between the upper and lower respiratory tract the lungs themselves ventilation we're gonna have an operational definition for ventilation versus respiration so be on the lookout for that difference in anatomical sciences versus nursing medicine we'll talk about the mechanics of breathing the sort of skeletal muscle the involuntary versus voluntary innervation that you have for breathing we're totally going to end up doing that thing where you accidentally start thinking about your breathing and then you're very conscientious of it and it's really annoying sorry uh, we'll talk about the innervation again voluntary and involuntary you definitely want to know which cranial nerves and which spinal nerves innervate those respiratory muscles because they're going to have clinical implications for you and of course aging and the respiratory system uh, part of our pulmonary ventilation and respiration we're going to talk about is going to be our super fun topic of the oxygen hemoglobin association curve which is where most people get caught up on this um, you really I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll save my rant for when we actually get there it's something that's never gonna go away so we're gonna spend a lot of time on it and you're gonna probably only start to understand it here and, and you'll get it again in patho and you'll get it again in med surge and it'll keep coming back for you so your respiratory system is about ventilation and respiration your respiratory tract itself is also going to have some other functions such as gas conditioning does anybody run like in the cold and like if you're running in the cold it kind of it kind of hurts your lungs a little bit you end up coughing for the day so anatomically uh, when you're breathing and you, especially if you're inhaling through your nose you're actually warming and moistening those gases that you inhale so that that cold air doesn't make it to your lungs which is why we tell long distance runners you have to inhale through your nose so that it at least gets some gas conditioning that's what we mean by gas conditioning is changing the temperature so that it's a little bit safer for the that mucosal surface inside of the lungs and um, changing the humidity sound production you're listening to me talk right now uh, olfaction you know all about your special sense of all the olfactory nerves located in the superior and slightly posterior surfaces a little bit lateral of your nasal cavity and that nasal cavity again is part of your respiratory tract and that action of inhalation is going to allow for inhalation of odorants those particles that adhere to those olfactory nerves that's really all we're going to talk about in terms of olfaction and then for defense we talked last week about malt mucosa associated lymphatic tissue you have some malt in your respiratory tract you have some white modified white blood cells in your lower respiratory tract within your alveoli you're going to have these things called dust cells that are macrophages and that's going to help prevent anything that you inhale from hurting you or at least that's going to be the attempt and we see in patho it's not always going to work out so we have an upper and lower respiratory tract and I'm going to give you a little bit of a warning that there's a little bit of a gray area here and I'll point out what it is and as always when there's a gray area and different sources disagree it is not going to impact your exam at all it is not going to be something where you have to decide one or the other on an exam and have that you know be where your point is at aside from dividing into upper and lower we can also divide into conducting and respiratory portions and what that means is the conducting portion is literally just conducting air air is moving through it whereas the respiratory portion is where respiration is happening and our operational definition for respiration and you going to want you're going to want to write this down the operational definition for respiration is gas exchange by contrast our operational definition for ventilation is the actions of inhaling and exhaling now when you're nurses you count respirations right and what are you counting when you're counting respirations 
inhalation and exhalation. You're watching their chest or abdomen rise and fall, right? So that's a different definition. Technically, what you're counting is ventilation, not respiration. But in the anatomical sciences, we say ventilation is the physical, mechanical, inhalation, exhalation, whereas respiration is at the cellular tissue chemical level of gases moving from one space to another across that membrane. So when we say respiratory portion, we mean the portion very, very deep in the lungs, very, very microscopic level where gases are being exchanged. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are being exchanged in the respiratory portion. And then that's way down here. We don't start our respiratory portion until those airways have split many, 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 many times. And I'll come back to the, this chart with the generations in a bit, but we're not quite there yet. So anatomically, you have upper versus lower. And here's exactly where that gray area is. This is going to consider your lower respiratory tract to include your larynx, which is your voice box, your trachea, your bronchi, which are your first splits of airways, your lungs themselves. Now, this lower respiratory tract designation gives you, that is a lower respiratory tract infection. If you have an infection of the bronchi, we consider that a lower respiratory tract infection. Do you consider laryngitis to be a lower respiratory tract infection? Anyone? Do we, no? No, I don't really either. And other sources will say that the larynx is an upper respiratory tract structure. So that's kind of the dividing line, if you want to think of it that way. In my opinion, you could put it in either category, probably upper in my opinion. But again, there's some conflict there. And I think we even have our own slide that is going to have that placed in the upper respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract is going to contain the sinuses. And you know about your sinuses from our skeletal lectures back in the day. You know, you have frontal, maxillary, sphenoidal, and ethmoidal sinuses. Those are upper respiratory tract. Your nasal cavity, your pharynx, again, your pharynx is a shared structure between respiratory and digestive. So we'll see the pharynx again next week. And again, I'm going to repeat this a few times. You have a nasopharynx posterior to your nasal cavity. You have an oropharynx posterior to your oral cavity. And you have a laryngopharynx posterior to your larynx. So they're just named after what they are posterior to. It is one structure. It's considered called funnel-shaped. And they lead to, the pharynx leads to, if it's food, hopefully it's going down the esophagus. And if it's air, hopefully it's going down the larynx, or sorry, yeah, the uh, trachea is a better way to put that. That epiglottis right here, we're going to find when we talk about digestive, that epiglottis is going to close over the larynx and prevent food from going into the trachea, at least when it's working correctly. So far so good? So here's a nice color-coded image for your pharyngeal spaces, narrow phary nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, red, yellow, blue, right there. Um, so I, I do like that image if I was going to test you on those pharyngeal spaces, but I could also test you about pharyngeal spaces on an image such as this. You'll see this image in your lab practical images. There's so much going on here. I could absolutely use this multiple times uh, just to get to different structures from different systems, right? There's a lot going on, so you're definitely going to want to know this inside and out. Remember those nasal conchae that we got so confused about in AMP1? There they are. Um, they're nasal conchae. Uh, they're also known as turbinates. They've got a couple of different names in the literature if you go looking for it elsewhere. And they are actually really cool. We talked about gas conditioning a little bit. They are very vascular. That superior nasal concha contains olfactory epithelium. The rest of these are very vascular. They actually sort of get engorged with blood and help to heat that air that comes into your nasal cavity. A vestibule, we'll see a few vestibules in the next few weeks. A vestibule, architecturally, you come into a house, there's a large open space, that is the vestibule of the house. That's used in architecture as well with a common name 
common origin, just entrance, like the grand entrance, the opening space. Dividing the nasal cavity from the oral cavity is the hard palate followed by the soft palate. When somebody has a cleft palate, what we mean by that is that there is, in all likelihood, a hole in this space. So a person with a cleft palate doesn't just have the cosmetic lip thing going on. It very likely they're going to have problems chewing, swallowing food without it getting into their nasal cavities. It's, so it's, it's a real medical issue aside from the, the cosmetic aspect of it. That, and you know, never discount the cosmetic aspect of it. Cosmetic stuff is life altering as well. You can also see your tonsils. There's your pharyngeal tonsil. Recall that that is in your nasopharynx. So if you open your mouth and say, ah, you cannot say that one, see that one. Your palatine tonsil and your lingual tonsil are also visible on this image. Your frontal sinuses and sphenoidal sinuses are visible on this image. Your epiglottis, your larynx, part of your trachea is visible here. And again, next week we'll focus more on the oral cavity for digestive. Note that that esophagus is posterior to the trachea. That's going to be important to us in just a bit. And here's the same view in a cadaver dissection. It's rather well done. You can see the ethmoidal sinuses here a little bit better. I don't know why medical illustration always flattens that out so much, because real world, that's, that's a space. Okay, good there. Paranasal sinuses, you've seen this image before. That should look familiar. Frontal ethmoidal sphenoidal maxillary, simply named after the bone they are located in. Now, lower respiratory tract, including your larynx, your voice box, your trachea, your bronchi, and your bronchioles, very much like uh, arteries to arterioles as they get smarter, or smarter, smaller, uh, we give them that eel sort of suffix. They get smaller and smaller, now they're bronchioles. Those bronchioles continue to get smaller and smaller as they split. Every time they split, we call that a generation. So you have your trachea, that splits one, that's your first generation. They split again, that's your second generation. And this is slide 13. It's actually portrayed here, the concept of generations right here. So trachea is generation zero, bronchi, main bronchi are generation one, secondary bronchi are generation two. And you're going to have many, many generations. Uh, this is going to represent exponential growth because every time it's split, they're all splitting, right? So you get many, many more every time it splits. So down here at generation 23, you've got your alveoli. That's what we're getting towards at the end. So by the time we get to respiratory bronchioles, we're going to be experiencing some degree of respiration at that point. We will have some diffusion of gases. This is a small enough structure that some diffusion of gases are going to start here. It is not the main site of cellular, no, sorry, not cellular, um, of respiration, external respiration. The alveoli are the air sacs at the ends of your terminal bronchioles, and those are gonna be our main site of respiration. This is where gas exchange mainly occurs. The alveoli are going to be very thin-walled. It's going to be a simple squamous epithelium. And they're going to be very vascular. There's going to be capillary beds completely surrounding every single air sac. So you're going to have the simple squamous epithelium of the alveolus. And later, we're going to see the simple squamous epithelium of the capillary bed. And that is the amount of space that oxygen and carbon dioxide need to cross for respiration to occur in that space. So far, so good? Now, larynx and vocal folds. This is your thyroid cartilage. You don't want to call it laryngeal cartilage. You want to call it uh, the thyroid cartilage. There is a laryngeal prominence. So that's your Adam's apple. Your hyoid's not your Adam's apple. Your laryngeal prominence is your Adam's apple. That 
the size of that is a function of the size of your voice box, your larynx. Note that your trachea is going to have C-shaped cartilaginous rings. They are incomplete on the posterior view. They do not go all the way back there. Why might uh, you not have complete tracheal cartilage keeping it a perfect O? Because you would think that would be better for maintaining patency, right? When you swallow something, your esophagus is right back here. That food bolus is going to push into this space. So it's going to, and so this is going to be soft to allow for the movement of food. Otherwise, that C-shaped cartilaginous ring, the function of that is to maintain tracheal patency, openness. It's absolutely plausible to crush that cartilage. It is hyaline cartilage, so it's sort of intermediate for strength. <laughs> Uh, the goal is to not crush that tracheal cartilage, or not have that tracheal cartilage get crushed. I'm starting up the computer over here because I want to watch a couple of videos. It's not going to work on my laptop, so we'll go over to the big screen. Uh, we're going to watch videos of vocal folds work, working in people who are singing. We can do a sort of uh, nasal camera. Uh, to look at people's larynxes while they speak, and it's going to look like something out of Alien movie, and it's fantastic. So I'm going to pause this, and we're going to go. So the names of the videos we just watched, we watched Mel Blanc's Vocal Chords, uh, posted by Z Warren 85 and before that, we watched Vocal Chords Up Close While Singing, posted by Jordan. So if you want to watch those again, you know where to find them. So yeah, it looks like something out of Alien, but we all have them right now. We use them all the time. That is inside of you. Okay, onto the larynx. It serves as a passageway. Burp, burp, burp. It's working on mine. Your larynx serves as a passageway for air. It prevents ingested materials from entering the respiratory tract. That would be your epiglottis. Produces sound for speech, and again, it's just the force of the air going through the larynx that gives you tone um, and quality, but the sounds that you make for language come from mostly your oral cavity, mostly. Uh, insists in increasing pressure in the abdominal cavity. We'll talk about that when we talk about uh, defecation, which is everybody's favorite topic. Uh, one common thing in defecation is sort of going and you kind of close your epiglottis over your trachea to increase the pressure in your thoracic cavity and that helps you defecate so everybody's favorite topic right there um, not that you really want to stop breathing while you're defecating but it is something we do involuntarily and participates in both a sneeze and cough reflex so you do have cranial nerve innervation visceral innervation um, you even have bitter receptors so the taste bitter right? You have specific receptors for that. You actually have those receptors in your airways. It's some, some more recent, recent finding. Um, and we think it's so that you know when you're inhaling something toxic or dangerous, because bitter usually correlates with toxins, things that are bad for you. Which, you know, is why we all love coffee so much, because it's slightly toxic. <laughs> Again, the position of that you have C-shaped cartilaginous rings. They are incomplete because of the location of the esophagus. They're connected by annular ligaments. There's a muscle, there's a smooth muscle on that posterior aspect of the trachea known as the trachealis muscle, controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And this is a pseudostratified columnar epithelium with mucin secreting goblins, goblet cells. That mucus that is in the airway is going to have a lot of interest for us when we get to patho. So again, it's ciliated, and there's mucus, so that when you inhale something, let's say uh, you're driving your Vespa to school, you're driving your scooter to school, and you're in traffic, and you're behind some diesel truck, and some of that carbon gets into your airway, right? We want that to land and get stuck in the mucus, and we want that cilia to be able to push that mucus back up. We don't want that carbon pollution to make it deeper into our airways. It also means that if you're in a lot of pollution, you're going to produce a lot more mucus to trap more of it. Or if you smoke, which is the same thing. Like sitting behind a diesel truck all day. I'm going, 
Yeah, that's the star. That's what smoking is. Also worth mentioning, anatomically, there is a special piece of cartilage at the bifurcation, at the split. When it goes from trachea to primary bronchi, you have a special cartilaginous ring known as the carina. C-A-R-I-N-A. -A. The carina is a specific location of the trachea. So here's the carina illustrated here. It's not labeled in a lot of your slides. I can still hold you to it on an image such as this or anything that shows a whole view of the lung such as that. You can see the carina there. Uh, at the carina, yes, so generation zero, generation one. I know you all love color coding so much, I'm sorry. Um, so this one has color coding for generations, and I really, it's really small, but I really do like the color coding there to illustrate the generations. We have the trachea, generation zero. We have the first, we have our first generation. Those are your main bronchi. And there's going to be two naming conventions for this. You've got main bronchi, and that's your primary bronchi. Then those main bronchi split, and those are going to be your, uh, let's see, lobar bronchi, and they're also going to be your secondary bronchi. Those are going to be further split, and it's in yellow up here. Tertiary bronchi are going to be lobular. I might have to double check my terminology here. And then it's going to further split into smaller bronchi, which will be quaternary. So I'm illustrating on the board right now, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. That's our sort of annotation for that. That's an acceptable annotation. For those numbers, but you will want to say bronchi. Segmental is probably a better word for that. Like, yeah, use segmental. I do like that better. Um, there's a reason I went to lobular. It'll make more sense when we get to kidneys, but. So main lobar segmental is the better term there, and smaller bronchi, uh, green, blue, yellow, orange, and primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. You can choose which way you want to refer to them. You can say, I want to refer to them as primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. If you're going into respiratory medicine, you're probably going to want to know all of these. And you probably want to be able to recognize what we're referring to. So I could ask you on the color-coded one, I could ask you over here. Obviously, there are some places that it would be less convenient to ask you. The tertiary, I think, is not as obvious where that delineation is over here. So I'd probably ask you something a little bit more obvious if I was going to use the non-color-coded surface for that idea. Quaternary. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Now something else to note aside from generations and their terminology here is also there are going to be three lobes on the right lung and two lobes on the left lung. And as such, there's going to be three lobar bronchi you can see here one, two, three lobar bronchi over here, and only two lobar bronchi over here. Why might that be? Heart. Your heart. Ah, oh, you guys got this one. Okay, so your heart is deflected to the left. It's going to take a little bit more space in the left portion of the thoracic cavity. You're going to have a cardiac notch for that heart here. This little bit right here is going to be known as the lingula. It looks like a little flappy, flappy tongue that covers the uh, part of the anterior surface of the heart. So to make room for that, yes, you do have a little bit less volume in the left lung, and you only have two lobes, and you only have two lobar bronchi as a result. 
also because this is deflected to the left, that means it's a little bit more of a straight shot from that trachea into the right lower lobe, right? So if your kid inhales a button, this is probably its trajectory. Statistically, this is where we're going to look for that button first, because that's where it's most likely to go. Sound good to everyone? EMS guy, sounds good? Yep, cool. I do know your name. I'm just calling you EMS guy for the... What's that? <laughs> yeah, at this point. <laughs> just for the recording, so that everybody agrees. So aspirated objects are more likely to enter the right lung, especially the inferior lobe. As those generations get smaller and smaller and smaller, we go from C-shaped cartilaginous rings to incomplete cartilaginous rings to little patches of cartilage as we go down. We're also going to go from ciliated pseudostratified columnar to simple columnar all the way down to simple squamous epithelium. So the epithelium type is going to change. As it moves from ciliated pseudostratified all the way down to, it even has a cuboidal phase that it's not even mentioning, don't worry about it though. It's going to lose those cilia as it transitions. So the deeper you get, the less ability you have to push pollutants back up to the trachea, which is really important, right? We need to get rid of as much of that stuff as we can before it gets down to this level, because once we get down to this level, we can't push it back up anymore. Recall that your lungs have autonomic innervation. Do you guys remember what happens in the lungs during fight or fly, flight? What's the word? Bronchodilation. So your bronchi do have layers of smooth muscle around them with autonomic innervation. And during sympathetic stimulation, you're going to bronchodilate. And during parasympathetic stimulation, you're going to bronchoconstrict. And you don't always think about muscles relaxing when you think about running away from a bear, so make sure that you actually have that connection. Bronchodilation is going to expand the airspace so that you have more uh, easy ventilation so you can breathe and get a lot of oxygen when you're running away from a bear. Again, we go from bronchi to bronchioles to terminal bronchioles, then to respiratory bronchioles. What's going to be the difference between terminal and respiratory bronchioles? It's in the name. It's the first site of gas exchange, gesundheit, in this track. So this is going to be the first place where we have the capacity to exchange gases. It's still not our main site of gas exchange. So those respiratory bronchioles give way to alveolar ducts. It's just a gradual transition. And then we end up in the alveoli, so alveolar sacs. This is a halfway decent portrayal of how closely the vasculature is associated with those alveoli. So really what we're talking about is Capillary beds literally embedded in the walls of the alveoli. And I think it's really hard for medical illustration to, cap to uh, capture just how intimately connected they are. If you're looking at it histologically, in fact, I'm going to go over here. You look at it histologically, you can see the simple squamous epithelium of the alveoli. And in a couple of places, you can see red blood cells because literally these walls of the alveoli also have capillary beds in them. They are embedded in these tissues. That's how intimately connected they are. They are directly adhered to one another. They even have a shared basement membrane. So that's what is going to allow for gas exchange. <clears throat> uh, so a wonderful scanning electron microscopy image of some uh, lung tissue that's been cut to show alveoli. This is 180 times magnification. <laughs> some zoomed out histology, and this is very far zoomed in histology. How are we doing so far? Okay. 
Now we do need to know a couple of specific cells that are going to be found down here. And they have a couple of different names. Your textbook likes alveolar type 1 and 2. You may also see the term pneumocyte. They mean the same thing. So a pneumocyte just means lung cell. An alveolar cell just means cell of the alveolus. They mean the same thing. It's there, this, they're synonymous. So you could say pneumocyte type 1, pneumocyte type 2. They would be synonymous. They're both equally important. Alveolar type 1 is the simple squamous epithelium I was talking about. So simple squamous epithelial cells and the function of simple squamous usually is going to be to allow nutrients to pass over. In this case, we're talking about gases. Carbon dioxide and oxygen are going to go a lot faster if they don't have very far to travel, and that's not very far to travel, as you can see on that image right there. This is why I love histology, because you can really visualize how easy this would be for some molecules. Alveolar type 2 cells do not participate in gas exchange. They do something just as important, though. They secrete surfactant. And when we get to patho, we're going to care a lot about surfactant. In chemistry terms, I know you haven't had chemistry yet for the most part. In chemistry terms, a surfactant is an emulsifier. It's something that binds to both water and oil, which generally water and oil don't mix. They help them to mix. For your purposes, what you need to remember about surfactant is that it decreases surface tension and prevents the collapse of alveoli. So here's what happens. You're born. When you're born, just before you're born in fact, your type 2 alveolar cells start releasing surfactant into the alveolar space. You're born, you take your first breath, you inhale for the first time ever. Your alveoli pop open. They've never been open before. Because surfactant is there, they stay open. They don't collapse again. So there's no, there's less surface tension, which means they can stay open. And that's really important because if you don't have surfactant when you are first born, let's say you're very premature and you haven't developed type 2 alveolar cells or your type 2 alveolar cells are not mature enough to produce surfactant. You're born, you take your first breath, the alveoli fill up for the first time, they can collapse right back down if you don't have surfactant. And that's infant respiratory distress syndrome, IRDS. Does anybody work in or around NICU in here? Or anybody ever had a child that went to NICU? Does anybody know the most common thing in the NICU? No, nope. respiratory problems. So respiratory development is one of the most important things for su survival prior to, to birth. Yeah, those type 2 pneumocytes literally start releasing surfactant right before the onset of labor. So if we induce early, we're even at risk of getting, getting them before they're producing surfactant. So that's a big deal. We care a lot about type 2 alveolar cells, just as much as we type, care about type 1 alveolar cells. Third type of cell I mentioned earlier, alveolar macrophages, commonly known as dust cells, <coughs> because they literally collect dust. I mentioned you lose your ciliation. You lose your cilia as you go from your bronchi down to your alveoli. And after a point, you can't get rid of things that are inhaled. Not very easily. So your macrophages are going to come along and eat anything that you encounter. And if you live, or if you live, if you work in a coal mine, they're going to really fill up with a lot of stuff really fast. And after a point, there's not really anywhere they can go. If they're, they're collecting more than they can handle, they can't effectively get rid of it. So um, we see it all the time in dissection. You can actually go into the lungs. It's going to give them that sort of spotted, darker look that you see for smokers, for example. It's collected in the dust cells. It's collected in the alveolar macrophages. So they're pretty cool. Uh, they are mobile, which is really cool. They move around looking for things you've inhaled that shouldn't be there. They do their job. Any questions about those cells? No? 
it is 8.52, so it's time for a break. I'm going to pause.